Hi everyone, uh, thanks uh, for joining us today. Uh, I'm Victoria, the captain of the Factory Berlin Solopreneur Circle, and uh, I will be your host for this event. So today we have a fantastic lineup of sales experts re ready to share their stories, best advice and tips on how to master the art of sales as a solopreneur or freelancer. Before we start, uh, I want to talk briefly about Factory Berlin. So Factory Berlin is an ecosystem of over 3,500 members from more than 70 nations located in two campuses, Görlitzer Park and Mitte Berlin. Uh, in there, you can meet the most ambitious uh, creators from the tech, creative and corporate industries. One uh, of the great things Factory Berlin offers is circles. Uh, these are self-organized uh, sub-communities gathered around shared interests, industries and projects where members exchange ideas, inspire and support each other. So this online event is organized for you by Solopreneur Circle. And as I mentioned, I'm the captain of the circle. So if you see me at the factory, uh, please don't be shy, uh, come and say hi. So there are a lot of advantages doing business on your own as a solopreneur. However, I say many would agree uh, that sometimes it does get lonely. I know myself uh, in running a solo business as a brand consultant, I need other people to share my experiences, get advice and be inspired. And Solopreneur Circle is a place to do just that. So uh, this event today is all about sales. In the next hour, we are going to learn from our speakers, Alan, Michael and Thibault uh, about how to embrace and enjoy the sales process, what pricing strategy to implement and how to find the sales approach that works for you. And also, please don't be shy and engage with us. Post your comments and questions in the chat. So uh, the first speaker uh, we have today is Thibault and he will do his best to help you overcome the stigma of salesmanship. So Tibau, please, um, the stage is yours and you know, tell us everything you know. Okay, yeah, thanks Victoria, thanks for having me. Can you hear me all fine? I guess you can. Uh, so uh, I'm going to just go, just let me know if, uh, you know, drop some comments in there. If there's any problem and you can't hear me, I'm going to just uh, go and share my screen and then uh, you'll be able to do that. So to understand what I'm talking about. So first thing that is important to do um, is make sure you have your phone with you. So your mobile phone around you because you're going to have to do scan a few QR codes. Um, so today I'm going to talk about overcoming the stigma of salesmanship. Uh, and before I just dive into that, I'm going to talk about why, uh, you know, I can talk about this. So this is a picture of me when I was 22 years old. Uh, at the time I was selling some, uh, I was actually an administrative assistant for a magazine that was called Plan Vol in Montreal, in Quebec. And I was selling, um, you know, like small ads, you know, into the magazine. So that was one of my first sales job, but even before when I was 15 years old, I actually uh, went and started selling airplane cleaning services uh, at the local airfield in Switzerland. So I'm French and Swiss, born in Switzerland, and I grew up in Lausanne. And I wanted to do my pilot license, which I did actually at 19 years old. And um, what happened is I wanted my parents to pay for that, but they were really clear. They will actually they would not pay for that so my grandfather told me hey you know instead of complaining and expecting others to finance your dream just go ahead find someone who will actually you know like let you clean the airplane or you know like let you just like work so you can actually make some money so that's what i did and uh you know i started cleaning airplanes for airplane owners in switzerland i was around 15 and uh, then what happened is i went to canada for my studies um where i studied i think marketing i completely forgot about that uh, but basically there i joined a company called buddy pilots which was a general aviation company and we're trying to do software as a service for managing flight schools and it's a very bad market you know like it's kind of a dying market it's really complicated so it didn't work but i learned a ton there 
And so when, you know, uh, I finished my studies and the company didn't work, what happened is that we decided, you know, I decided to leave to Berlin and this is where I really learned about sales. So tech sales, B2B sales. So I became a card executive for a company called Applause, which is a crowd testing company. And uh, it was very interesting, you know, because I learned how to do hardcore outbound prospecting, no marketing, just like picking up the email, sending tons of emails. And then I grew the French market for from zero to 2.5 billion of annual recurring revenue, grew the, the team from zero to 10 people and really learned a lot there. So at some point after two years and a half, I was a bit tired of it. So I went to another job and uh, this is where I met my mentor and partner who's named Skip Miller. Uh, and basically that's when I discovered I wanted to do some sales training. So after five months in the job, I left, created my own company, which is Sales Labs. And what I'm doing now is I train and coach tech sales people to generate opportunities and, uh, you know, like close deals faster. So everything that I apply for tech sales people can work for freelancers or solopreneurs. Um, so you can hear me into, uh, you know, talking in regular events. I've been, uh, you know, featured in uh, company blogs like G2, Vidyard, Sales Hacker. I'm also like the co-host of the B2B Sales Podcast me, with my wife. We got over a thousand, a hundred, uh, uh, you know, like uh, listener every month. So if you're actually interested in learning about sales, there's a ton of good things you can actually find there. And so what I'm going to do there, uh, that's the first QR code you have to do is to add me on LinkedIn. So you can pick up your phone, scan this QR code, or just go on LinkedIn and look for Thibaut Suiris on that. And um, while we're in there, just wanted to check, do a sound check if everyone can hear me. So it uh, would be amazing, Frédéric, if you can uh, tell me if you can hear me or just like, you know, just show, do, show me a sign. Yeah. Yes, you can hear me. That's fantastic. You know, just have to, uh, it's not that easy to actually go and uh, check like with the, the presentation going on. So I'm going to just check on LinkedIn if I got some people who are adding me to see if this is working, if this is working. Cool. Perfect. So um, just going to give you like another 30 seconds to scan that. Um, you know, again, what you can do is simply like go and uh, and scan this QR code with your phone, open the photography, like the, the camera app, scan this, and then you're going to be able to access directly to my LinkedIn profile. So once it's done, make sure you still have your phone with you because we're going to have another scan to do. So here, what I want you to do, you have two choices. You can, again, scan the QR code you have here, and you're going to have to answer what's the first word that comes to mind when you think about sales. If you don't have a QR code, you go to slido.com slash factory sales and you answer the question with your phone. So I'm going to give you a few seconds for that. I'm going to scan it too, by the way. Money, buying. Cool. So far, so good. Support. Difficult. Okay. Someone's having difficulties with sales. Pushy. Ah, I love that. Convincing. Ah, even better. But pushy. That's a classic. Yeah. Being convincing. Product awareness building. Okay. We're going to wait to reach at least 10 before moving on. Fun. Okay, someone's having fun there. <laughs> uh, money, productivity, persuasion. Okay, cool. I like that. And I need one last word and then we can move on. So support being influence. I like that too. Influence. Interesting. Interesting. It's actually very common. You know, we always get kind of the same words when you think about sales, um, you know, like blind emailing like that. You could call that cold emailing. Uh, oh, we have even more stuff now being convincing. Okay. Now that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. It's pretty, you know, like the crowd is pretty, uh, let's say, you know, like 
it's it's quite common like everyone thinks pretty much the same about sales so that's uh, the customer pain this is great this is great by the way so uh let me just move on and talk uh, talk a bit more um, about that so let me tell you a story about sales so this is my motorcycle uh i'm a big uh, motorcycle fan uh, it's actually in the garage right now uh, someone tried to steal it but basically this uh, is this is a yamaha mt07 which i bought in 2018 a bit you know around six months after i did my uh, motorcycle license and it was pretty cool but it was a really painful buying experience for me let me tell you a bit more about that so i went to the motorcycle did a lot of research so if you think about selling there's always a sales process on one end which is like the way people are selling the way we typically sell and the buyer's journey the way you know, like the buyer is getting informed and making this journey towards being totally unaware of a, of a problem or, or a product to actually uh, making a buying decision and paying the, the product. And in that case, the product is a motorcycle. And the problem I had with that is I checked everything. I knew I wanted this neon, you know, with the kind of yellow, uh, uh, yellow tires and everything. And uh, I went to the shop and the guy, you know, I told him, hey, I would like to actually check a bit the MT-07. I'm pretty convinced I want to buy it, uh, you know. And the guy smelled, he smelled, he had what we call a commission breath. So he smelled the commission. And so what he told me, he knew I was a pretty hot lead. I was pretty much convinced I wanted to buy it, not because of the guy who was selling it, but because I did my research. And what he, he did, you know, he told me, hey, uh, so basically this bike, we have three you know, so this is just like a, a show, show off bike or just, you know, uh, back in the shop. You say, this one's sold already. We have three that are on the boat from Japan because they're produced in Japan. Two are already sold and there's one in this color, which is the one you want. And so he kind of put like a forced pressure on me to go and buy this bike. And that was a terrible moment for me because he really robbed me of this buying decision. So basically... What I had to do, I was quite convinced even before I entered the shop, but he put like an, a pushy tactic to actually try and close me fast, which he did. And I really hated that, even though I've been in sales for a while and I knew about the tactic, I was not really able to know if he was bluffing or not, but it was really a bad experience. So that's really like what we typically think about when we think about salespeople. Very often we have salespeople that are selling motorcycles or cars that are very pushy and doing this thing. And it's often, you know, linked to the fact that they are 100% commission based, which if you think about it, when we are freelancers and solopreneurs, that's exactly the same for us. So that was really a bad experience because as I said, I was robbed of making the decision at my own speed. And, you know, in sales, you can do plenty of things to kind of influence the deals and making sure people are signing on your own terms. But often, you know, when you're doing that, you're actually uh, destroying kind of the relationship with that. So that was pretty bad. And uh, that, wa that was really something I didn't like. So here I'm going to talk to you about five points that are super important whenever you are doing sales uh, that are a bit counterintuitive. So first of all, sales is nothing about convincing or persuading or influencing people. Sales is first about finding problems. So, you know, like uh, uh, there's a, a curve. I don't know exactly the, graph, the name of the graph again, but basically what's important whenever you're doing sales is to start with finding problems because people often are unaware they have a problem. That's the typical state of very much a lot of people. Then when they start having a problem, you know, they, they start being aware about this problem. So, for example, I was uh, in my case, you know, I was. Uh, buying a washing machine so that, that's always the example I, I take so when the washing machine works no problem no issue i'm unaware of anything then the machine starts making a bit of noise then i know there's a bit of a problem i need to think about that and then when it starts making a really crazy clunky noise i know i have a big problem and that's where i'm actually looking for a solution think about it the same way when you're selling first you have to find a problem that's the first thing you do no problem no sales you know, in B2B, whenever we're selling services, consulting, products, whatever, you first have to find a problem to actually make sure you can start even the conversation. Then what you have to do is to quantify the problem. So a problem is, you know, often something that is going to be related to money, to time, uh, to markets, you know, ROI and a lot of things. And if you can quantify a problem, you're in business. So it's very easy to do when you're a freelancer, uh, you know, let's say you're doing some design or you're an architect, um, you know, for design people will often, you know, try to uh, ask you for a logo. And what you're going to have to do is to try and find why they want to actually work with you. Why don't they go on Fiverr and do a five-year logo? They're going to talk about the brand, what it represents for them. And then what you can do is try and ask, 
you know, what's the, the quantified amount? What's the amount of money that a good logo would mean for them or a bad logo would actually mean for them? How much business would they lose because of that? So really that's the idea of, of quantifying. And one thing that is, you know, very easy for me, for my case, you know, whenever I, I work with people, I try to understand uh, what's the missed revenue typically they have. And, you know, it can sometimes, you know, people will explain you, I have 10 sales people, they need to do 2 million uh, euro each year. They are each making 1 million. So there's a 10 million euro revenue uh, loss, basically. Then I have this big 10 million euro problem. It's going to be easy for me to sell something at 1 million because it's 10% of that. So that's the second rule. The third rule is make sure you disqualify early. This is super important. So, you know, the commission breath I talked about is something we get when we're really, really needy. We need money. And that happened to a lot of us where you get this feast and famine cycle where, you know, when you're consulting or freelancing, you get a lot of business, everything works well, a lot of work, and then it all dries out and then you need to go and sell. This situation is really tough. So what you need to do is to make sure you create pipeline. So you have opportunities going uh, and conversation going on regularly. So you can actually have the luxury of disqualifying people who don't have a problem you know, either don't have a problem or don't have a problem big enough for you to solve. That's the third thing. Then build a solution with your customers. This really, if there's one thing you need to, to remember from this session, when people say, send me an offer, don't do it. Don't send an offer. That's the biggest mistake I see, especially freelancers uh, doing is that they send offers and uh, they expect uh, uh, prospects to actually, you know, get the offer and then just sign it. First of all, an offer is never an education document. It's always a validation document. So for me, what I do, you know, when I find a problem, quantify it, then I'm going to talk about the solution with my customers. And instead of saying, hey, we have this, 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 and this, I'm going to say, you know, we offer this kind of thing. How will you use it? Why, you know, should you work with us? Why us and not the others? And then the, the customers will actually tell you their reasons for buying your stuff and they will take ownership. There's a story for that. It's called the transfer of ownership. Um, whenever you are, let's say, buying a pair of shoes, what happens is that uh, you go, let's say, to a shop, then uh, the person, you know, like the salesperson comes to you, ask you what you want to do, and you say, hey, I want maybe this pair of shoes, what's your size? I don't know, it's 41. They go back to the shop, you know, the, the back of the shop, they take this pair of shoes you, you picked plus two others. And whenever they do that, you put the shoes on your, on your feet, you try the other ones, and you do what we call a transfer of ownership. So you are building, you know, the salesperson is making you sell, you know, the shoes to yourself. So they're not saying, hey, these are great shoes, they're amazing, whatever. They're just building a solution to help you. And then, you know, you're able to kind of convince yourself that the shoes look good on you. Exactly the same when you're selling B2B services, solutions or whatever. You are selling a solution and the customers are often going to build that with you. Whenever you're doing that, you have momentum, you have energy, new deals, and the offer is just a validation document that you show. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can even just don't even sign a contract and send uh, invoices that it can also work. And final point, know your number. So what I mean know your number is know how much money you want to make at the end of a year or any kind of time period you want to check, and then figure out how many offers you need to show so how many deals you need to close? You maybe have an average deal size. How many deals you need to close? How many offers you need to show? How many uh, solutions you need to build with the customer? How many discovery call initiative calls you need to have? And how many touch points, let's say you have every day on LinkedIn, called email or whatever, you need to do every day to be able to reach that. If you know your number, there's an equation that works that is, you know, like that is clear, that's gonna help. And this is all about consistency for me. Typically, what I do every morning, I have a, a system that I call Power Hour, where I prospect, you know, I use mostly LinkedIn. I add five people to my uh, cold outreach sequence. Then, you know, uh, I do some follow-ups. And, you know, consistently, since I've started doing that, I get around 38% reply rate, around in like nine, you know, it's around nine to 10% of people are actually booking a call with me. And out of this, you know, nine, 10%, around 60 become an opportunity. So there's a real deal. And around out of the 60%, there's around 40% that close. I know my equation. I know my goals. I'm working towards my goals. That's really what's really the most important in there. Um, and so here, I just wanted to talk about an example uh, in terms of a good sales process and a good way to overcome that. You know, an example of that is my insurance broker. So his name is Robert. And what he's done, you know, in our case, if we take the five points, 
First of all, that's when I was buying the motorcycle. I needed an insurance. They gave me the contact of this guy and he told me, okay, what's the bike? You know what you want to do? What kind of insurance do you want to do? I checked, I told him, hey, I checked on Trek 24. It's too expensive. He found actually an insurance that was half the price of the cheapest on Check24, found a problem and he found a solution. That's what he did, you know, quantifying the problem and then having a solution. And then, he, you know, he didn't have to disqualify me in that case because I was already uh, pretty ready to actually go and buy something. Uh, and then he built the solution with me. He did it with so many other things, you know, like the insurance of my company. He found me a tax lawyer. He's always been with me, maintaining this relationship, finding problems and pro providing solutions, basically. And he knows his number two. So that's, uh, that's really the example of Robert in that case. So what I'm going to do now, just pick up your phone, scan that and tell me what you will you focus on as of today on things we talked about. First, find problem, quantify problem, disqualify early, build a solution with customers, know your number, all of the above or no, none of the above. Okay, now your number, that's good. All of the above, very nice. I like that. People are starting with uh, finding problems. That makes a lot of sense. Knowing your number, very good. Don't forget to quantify your problems. Don't forget that. Very important. But finding the problem will is just the first key. If you find problems, that's going to be a lot easier. Always hunt for solution. Don't uh, hunt for problems. Sorry, don't hunt for solutions. And that's one thing that is super easy to do when you're freelancing, because you often don't have a product. You know, you have knowledge on something, so you can provide solutions in different ways. So you don't come to people saying, "Hey, I'm a sales consultant or I'm a designer." You have to come and ask what are their problems, so then you can go and find a solution for them. But pretty cool, all of the above. Perfect. Good. So um, now I just wanted to, uh, uh, you know, before we go into the, 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 how to say the question part, just wanted to give you a last thing to scan. It's called the T-shaped sales community. So it's actually a, a community I have of tech sales people. We are over a hundred. We have a lot of solopreneurs also who are launching their own product. And if you want to join this community, there's one new sales training that is online. It's on demand online training every month. So if you're interested, you can just scan that, go and check the website. And it's actually a 10 euro per month subscription. And you get access to all the uh, historical online training, plus one new training every month. We talked about building content on LinkedIn, using video for prospecting, using multiple channels for prospecting and all these kind of things. So if that sounds interesting for you, just go scan that and you'll see a lot of things there. I also have like an experimentation swipe file where I share my cold outreach sequences you know, like with the messaging, everything in there. We have a Discord group. And so there's tons of things we have in there. So if you're interested, just go and check that. And, uh, you know, I'm going to open for the questions. So uh, Victoria or Frederick, if you have anything on the questions, um, happy to answer them. So it seems like uh, people are a bit shy uh, and uh, do not ask questions. I don't think that everyone is so good at sales. So please do ask, you know, if then, you know, our speakers and in this case, Tibor can really give the more tailored answer to your, you know, specific problem, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I then have a question. So, Go you know, ahead. Like all those uh, five steps, which one was the most difficult for you personally to wrap your hand around and, you know, which one took the longest to, to really master and understand the importance of it? So for me, it was really quantify problems. Uh, that's, that's I think, the toughest based on what, you, what you're what you doing. Right now, it's something I, I still struggle sometimes to do. Uh, so I'm not perfect or whatever. Just I, I really sometimes struggle in, in quantifying these problems because it can be hard whenever you found a problem to actually go deeper and try to understand exactly what's, you know, like give the, this kind of quantification. Because very often when, let's say, you know that... Um, in your case, Victoria, like you're, you're doing like brand consulting, right? Yes, yeah. What's the big problem you're solving? 
Hmm, the big problem. <laughs> Good I mean, question. give me one, one example for a customer of problem you're, you're solving. Um, the, the chaos. Actually, the problem is sometimes the chaos and, uh, and understanding of what, what is going on. So I also, I don't go and don't see that now we will create you specifically, I don't know, beautiful um, um, visual identity or mm -hmm. the strategy, but uh, quite often it's like, it's just, uh, yeah, people are not entirely clear what's happening. So okay. this strategy or this visual identity gives them the clarity and kind mm. of the, the yeah feeling so, of being organized. So let's say you come to me and you say, hey, Thibault, you know, I say, hey, uh, uh, come to you and say, I want to actually clarify my brand. It's kind of like messy everywhere, uh, you know? And then what's going to happen is that very often you're going to be like, oh yes, I'm having this call with Thibaut and he's exactly in the problems I have, you know, like I can solve. Then you're going to start getting excited about it. You're going to have what we call happy ears. You're going to be like, that's amazing. I can, you know, he has problems, he has chaos, I can help him. But what you don't know is, is maybe something that I'm thinking of and that is not key to my business. And you know, that's why you need to understand, okay, why is chaos? Why is like the fact of having not a clear identity a problem for you? And I can tell you, I don't know, like uh, people don't recognize me. So okay, and why is that a problem? Yeah, because then they see like a different color, different font, whatever, they, there's no kind of brand identity. They don't trust me. Okay, and what is the impact? The fact that they don't trust me is that they, you know, like they go on under competition and like, what's the impact of that? I don't know, maybe 10,000 euro a month lost. Quantifying is this kind of, of process which can be quite challenging because you need to really push and ask a lot of questions and it can be uncomfortable, basically. Yeah, that that's really good. And now I got, you know, the like personal consultation. So here you go, Absolutely. guys, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the idea is to get the, is to get that. Oh, we have a question here. Do you have mm -hmm. any suggestion for those that have just started and they are still building their solution proposition? Yes, that's first, congrats, because that's the best state in which you can be because you're not going to go and try and sell stuff. You know, you're just building. So again, find problems. You know, you try to ident identify what I call the ideal customer profile, ICP. And you say, okay, that's the type of company I want to talk to, the person in the, the job title. So for me, I talk to software as a service companies in Europe that have between 50 and 250 employees. And I'm going to talk to the VP of sales. That's my primary target. So, um, so basically, I'm going to go and try to understand what problems they have. So one good thing you can do, uh, it's a good excuse to prospect and get in touch with people is to say, hey, I'm launching a podcast, an interview series, and I'm trying to find the top 10 problems of what you're doing. So Federica, I don't know what you're selling, but if you're selling, I don't know, let's say you're selling uh, uh, whatever, like tax consult uh, like your, the tax consultant, you're going to go and find business owners. What are the problems you have with tax, uh, tax consultant? Like talking with the financiant, uh, that declaration. You know, you can interview people on what are their problems. And then you're going to have a clear idea of what are the problems you need to solve. And then the amazing thing is that you're going to have a podcast series that you can actually launch talking about the problems you're solving. So that's the first thing I would do. There's a saying is like you build a media company and then you build like a product. So for me, I've been building an audience. My audience tells me what it, what it wants, and then I serve products about that. So that's that's what I would do. Uh, so let me check. So what's the most successful channel from your experience for service providers of more high value services, corporate trainings, call outreach, intro in your network, others? So John, I think this is really depends. Uh, one thing that works really well you know, in what I've seen is that you're building, you know, especially if it's your own business, you're building your own personal brand. You find a channel, for me, it's LinkedIn. And on LinkedIn, I post every day, I grew from 2,500 to more than 15,000 followers in around a year and three, four months. And basically, whenever you're doing that, um, you actually are attracting people in there. And then, you know, you can go and start selling to them. So for me, typically I post, I get around, 4,600 views every three months, every quarter. And so it means like, I don't know, like 20, 30 interesting people every day check my profile. I'm gonna go use that and then say, hey, just so you check my profile, uh, you know, like I'm curious to know if you found everything you were looking for. And this is what gets me a 38 to a 39% reply rate. So what I would say is if people are on LinkedIn, post content that is gonna talk about their problems 
And then you're going to be able to have a lot more conversation than just cold outreach, basically. So uh, thanks a lot for, yeah. for, for, for you know, like answering the questions. Uh, we still have two more speakers. Uh, so maybe later, if uh, there is still some time left, Tibo can answer the questions. Uh, but also, you know, like you now uh, connected with him on LinkedIn. So, you know, you have uh, the platform to, to continue the conversation. Yeah. So thanks touch, a lot, Tibo. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you very much. Uh, I have with all those five points written down and ready to start implementing okay. them. Cool. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. So uh, the next uh, uh, is Michael, and he will share with you how to find your price point. So that is a very exciting and interesting topic. So, Michael, uh, please, the stage is yours and uh, tell us everything you know. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, Thibault, very interesting um, presentation, really liked it, learned something. Loved the quick um, analysis of Victoria, um, very fast and impressive. So, um, talking quickly, today my topic is finding your price point um, for solo entrepreneurs. Um, quick agenda is quick introduction about myself, um, how to set your price as freelancers, pricing models, how to calculate your hourly rate, how to calculate your fixed price, um, how you actually should calculate your price point and then price perceptions and my personal learnings. So a little bit about myself. I studied a business with a major in hospitality, worked quickly in hospitality and then was able to join um, a very young startup, um, Copycat of Hotel Tonight here in Germany, first in Cologne and then in Berlin. Um, learned more or less my first step in sales from one of, or there were very, four very experienced founders and one of the founders was uh, the XVP sales from Eurowings. And I could learn the first steps on um, cold calling and putting a, a product on the, on the market. And we were a discount model with high commission. So cold calling was very interesting, um, calling all these hotels. Um, after doing this one and a half years, I founded my first own company, Today Tickets, an event business, uh, distress inventory with a with an, um, main investor, ProSevens, that I the media house. Um, we didn't really make an, a good second uh, project or second round, um, so we sold the company um, after one year. I did a little bit, got, got a little bit dive into sales consulting back then on Epic companies for for their ventures. Got my first experience there how to how to structure sales organizations um, as a consultant, and then um, decided to found another company. It was a, the MK Real Estate, a, a project development company for hotels where we build hotels on top of other buildings. So um, um, a complete different model there could learn a lot of building processes um, and really defining processes 100%, um, which then helped me after I left it two and a half years later because it didn't really make me happy still running the company. And we built a couple of hotels, but um, I don't know, the real estate business wasn't really mine. So um, joined the Lufthansa Innovation Hub for, for a quite while as a freelancer. Um, Doing, doing their sales consulting and interim CEO, um, then joined a startup called 99 Chairs as a VP sales, where I could really build um, a successful sales team, growing it um, from within one year, from 1.5 million of revenue to 8.5 million of revenue with not really increasing the sales uh, people by having three and a half, four sales, but really um, um, growing on uh, to, with, with processes and structures um, and an outreach approach, which worked really well. Um, which then brought me to my to my, my final company or where um, the sales consulting Krimanski company where I started as a solopreneur or a freelancer um, focusing on sales um, structuring and sales um, learning smaller. So we help companies to to structure and digitize their sales organization. I started this company in, in 2018 um, with a friend where we did more or less on our own um, freelancing. We called it back then already very fast. Um, a company or a brand because we actually um, did some did some learnings on which I share with you later. Um, did the first one and a half years um, freelancing, and then I decided to grow the company. We now around uh, fifteen people joining, um, growing, growing further, cash flow based, um, and mainly working in the in the field of digital sales, consulting, structuring sales systems, implementing sales systems, um, having lead generation as a service, sales operations as a service, interim management as a service, um, having um, building a coaching hub and having um, sales recruiting as a service. So a fully um, 360 degree sales service uh, consultancy. 
So when it comes to, to our topic on, on how to set your prices as a freelancer, um, there are several ways, obviously, on how to calculate your pricing. Yeah, So you can set on the one side hourly rates, or you can charge project base, or even in sometimes run on a monthly retainer. But the most important thing is before you really decide how much you charge, how what is your model, um, you should do your homework yeah, to get a good understanding of the possibilities, what the market is offering, but what you offer as well. So the first step is you need to write down your qualification, your experience, the products you would like to offer, then the projects you are able to do. Uh, you should define the geographic locations um, where, you will, yeah, will, where you will operate in. Define your main target market from your from your gut feeling, what you what you want, who you want to sell to, buying personas, get a good understanding of their needs, their challenges, um, and their emotions, what they're happy with in their job and what not. Um, define, do some research about freelancer platforms. So um, get an understanding what others charge, um, how they how they work in similar project with a similar experience as well. Um, and I would even speak to other freelancers in your field and ask them how they do, how they manage their projects, how much they charge, how they work, learn from them what's going well and not. And don't be afraid asking others. Yeah, it always helped me to really talk with others about it. Yeah. So once you have done your homework, you can actually start um, in, in, in calculating. So Obviously, there are different pricing models, which I which are already uh, which I already um, um, mentioned. So there are general thoughts on two ways, two ways on, on how, how you calculate, because I think that's the main impact or the main possibilities you have. So it's pricing per hour um, with the advantage of it's much easier to calculate um, than trying to work out project or value project based. It gives you flexibility to charge, especially if you don't really know how long things take if you do it. Yeah. Um, and you can gain experience, gives you the possibility to gain experience um, on, on your projects. Yeah? So I think in the beginning, it's quite good to start with an hourly rate. That's what we did, or that's what I did, um, and, then, and then learn from it. The disadvantage of hourly rates is if you're getting faster, or let's say you are faster than you expected, you earn less money. Yeah? And when you get more experience, you risk hitting money or price ceiling because you need to charge such high, high hourly rates that your clients most probably won't be willing to pay for it. And an hourly rate lifts you to only earning money according to the work you put input. So you're very limited in the, in the, in the way of earning money. Yeah? On the other side, as I said, I think an hourly rate is sometimes the best option for new freelancers starting out, um, especially if you don't know how long your project takes. And um, with hourly pricing, you can learn, um, you can you're not worrying about over underestimating. You just work it out with your clients um, um, for open-ended jobs. The fixed price on the other part is you really have advantage. So having advantage on if you know your job, if you know how long things take, if you know your products, you won't lose money because you're a fast worker. The client knows exactly how much the project will cost. And this is a big advantage to have transparency um, on the project you're going to deliver. Um, the amount of money is not kept the, your own uh, own hours, yeah. So let's say you have one product um, which you sell to several clients. Obviously, um, first of all, you know better how to do it. You maybe define templates which you can use, which makes you faster. So you can increase the possibility of earning um, of earning uh, money um, in, within the same time. And one more, one really important thing is. Um, a client, for example, is, is much easily or much more buying projects than price per hour. So, for example, a project is 300 hours. They would rather buy the, the project for 300 hours than buying two hours for 150 euros because 150 euros an hour seems for some clients very high. Yeah? And if you do a project-based pricing, you can even say, look, we have this, we have this fixed price and we can, if, I, if I do it to your complete um, satisfaction, you can even negotiate a bonus on it, which is then um, far um, on, on their side. Yeah? The disadvantage of using a fixed rate pricing is it's not really easy um, to really calculate um, on what, how much, how long it will take, or you'll be able to estimate how long the project will actually set for you. Yeah? You have to include deadlines, um, so how many edits you have to do. So for example, if you're a designer, and um, they are quite often surprises within the project, especially if getting more complex um, by extra requests or undefined things, which increases your workload. 
um, especially if the project of, takes longer than expected um, and the client even though um, or additionally adds, adds new requests, you have to renegotiate and renegotiating on a fixed price, it's always very hard. Yeah? But a fixed price, right? Um, if you're an experienced freelancer and experienced what you do and you know exactly what you're doing, charging fixed prices is, um, is, is the best way on increasing your hourly rate or increasing your, your total income in the real market. Yeah? So also ideal for small projects um, it's better to, to to charge fixed prices because if you have small prices, let's say in a price range up to two, three thousand euros, it's much easier to charge a fixed price than a couple of hours for a high hour rate because your value you're bringing in the short in the short project is much higher than than the two hours you actually work in. So in this case, if you're starting, um, work from the work with the um, Work with the, uh, the the hourly rate, and if you go, if you're more experienced, you should um, you should work on your on your project based. But before all both of these models, obviously, it's always important what is the the right hourly rate or what's the right price. So when I speak about pricing with freelancer friends or on the network, and we're discussing, I quite often hear that many use a bottom up approach. Yeah, so. Um, they're calculating the costs they're having, maybe they're calculating the, the salary they have, um, um, and then based on this, they define what is their price that they, they actually should charge. Frankly speaking, I don't think this is the right way to calculate your price points. Um, because it's a complete internal view. Yeah? It's only your view on the market. Um, and it does not take into consideration your market circumstances at all. So if you have done your homework effectively, if you should, you should have a good understanding about your potential clients, the buying personas, their needs, the actual market you're aim, aiming to work in. Furthermore, you should have an understanding of your experience, your skill level, and what other freelancers in similar levels are offering and charging. So considering your research um, to estimate the average hourly rate for your field of work, um, then wonder whether your experience and location you play places you are, you are above or below the average of the competing freelancers. And finally, you can set at least you, are, you have an understanding about your hourly rate. Obviously, it will take a bit of trial um, and trial and error to, to discover whether your hourly rate is accepted by your potential clients, if you're able to actually sell um, with the right confidence. Taking Thibault's um, um, suggestion into consideration will hopefully increase um, your po potential on selling. Um, but while using a market-based approach, your initial rate should be already very close to your final starting rate, yeah? Because it's it's completely based on research and your knowledge and it's not based on your internal circumstances. Yeah? So, for example, you live in Berlin Mitte, your circumstances have a higher price than you live, I don't know, in, 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 in Kreuz Kreuzberg, it's expensive as now as well, but let's say you live in Kreuzberg and this would have an effect on the rate you're selling, this shouldn't be rate, yeah? And one thing, what is really important here um, when defining your hourly rate, is you rather have a too high rate than a too low rate. Yeah? Why? A low rate has an extremely negative impact on the perceptions of your skills and quality. Yeah? Because good talents are not selling at low rates. Yeah? As further you grow into, I don't know, clients away from, let's say, startups, as further you grow into, into SMEs, you will learn that they have an ex a minimum expectation of your rates. Yeah? On the other part, the second part you should consider is using a higher rate um, can always be, you can always use that your selling tactics. Yeah. So you rely on your client's reactions, feedback to offer and reduce rates. So you can actually negotiate. A low rate already is hard to negotiate. Yeah. And if you have a higher rate, you can you can use on the or you can you can see the feedback, get the feedback or understand the reactions and then say, look, because of the higher volume or because of this, I will reduce my rate as as the follows. Yeah. Like this, you can please your clients. I'm already in the negotiation. You can communicate open about it without losing your face. And you can increase or you can decrease or you can adapt the rate to the needs of your clients, yeah? which makes it much easier for them to actually, to actually buy. So calculating a fixed price, as discussed, can be, can be very, very um, can even be called complex, especially if you don't know how long things take. Uh, be long things take, yeah. But 
essentially your fixed price for a project should be by quick or let's say if you're able to, to understand what value you bring your, your fixed price should be based on the value of your time and skills that we go into it and it should be considered a market price for it so in the first step you already should gain some experience let's say in your first project on your hourly rate you should gain some experience on delivering the project yeah so you understand what value you can bring yeah you should roughly know how long things will take you should deliver the defined tasks, including including PM, yeah. So uh, meetings, etc. You should already consider that, so you know what the time needed, phone calls, research, etc. So on the one part, first part, obviously, you multiply this by the estimate time by your regular hours, and then you have a starting point by your fixed price. But when the interesting part begins, when you actually consider the value are you are delivering, yeah, you're getting back to the quality. Of your homework you should have again you should have a decent understanding so if you know what what you from delivering your service how you make an, a difference how you bring advantages um, to the client you can use a value-based pricing model and value-based pricing model means you're charging based on the value of your work instead of the value of your time or your skills so let's say and the interesting part i'm coming later to is the perception of the client on it um, what is actually value, all they needed, what they actually need from the topic. So, for example, yeah, um, let's say you are a web designer um, who is asking, I don't know, you, you should design a new a new website. You're calculating, for example, the hour, it's a small landing page, and or it has a couple of pages, and it takes you, I don't know, 15 hours um, of design, and then maybe two, three, four hours on, on, um, on, on the project management yeah so plus obviously to your to access to your to your experience um so let's say you have this you have a total of i don't know 70 hours or something so 17 hours for the for the for the website and i'm um, let's say your your daily or your hourly rate is what 65 or something 60 65 so the, if you calculate the fixed price on the project you calculate by hourly rate it would be around i don't know 1000 1100 or something like this yeah but if you take into consideration the value you're delivering um, to the client on the one side by having a new website on the other side the experience you have by especially defining this kind of websites you can easily increase total the total price of the website to three four thousand euros because if you can communicate on the value you bring um, instead of putting the focus on the hourly hour, hours you work on, um, the discussion will not be on the time; it will only be on the value. So, and this again, having done your research, what the value you can deliver will be a, will will enable you to increase the hourly rate. Or increase not the hourly rate, increase the total project value on the project you're developing. One part is the theory, and the theory is the hourly rates and then the project based rates. Um, and also, you have done your research and you know your prices and you know your calculation. Um, this should not be the final price for every single client. Yeah. In my opinion, you should use your experience. So you should use the, the hourly rate in, in the beginning to get an understanding um, of your own work. On the other part, you, you increase your, your, your number or you increase your, your project value by calculating it on project based and getting an experience there um, who, is, who is reacting on what price and what you can sell. But the best way is in increasing your you actually rate is adapting your price to the individual needs of your clients. So, because in my opinion, there are always possibility to increase your prices. Yeah, because before you start writing an offer on the client, you should always ask yourself a couple of questions. How much is this particular client willing to pay for the service I will offer them? Yeah, obviously it always gets a little bit tricky on the, let's say ethical sides, if we have the same product with the same work and having different prices, but, um, startups are usually obviously have used to different hourly rate than SMEs or even corporates. Yeah, so most of the time they have different budgets. Yeah, and why should I not adapting my prices to the different client types? Yeah, so I usually ask the clients quite right in front what they have actually budgeted for this project. Honestly, most or let's say a couple of clients actually tell you right away the budget, so you already know what they budgeted. A couple of other clients. Um, then 
will not will not actually tell you. They understand they are, are more interested in what is your, let's say, what is your way of paying it. And then they say, look, what, what would be the value you offer? And then I'm staying awake. Is I'm always saying, look, depending on the, the scope of the project um, and the scope of the value I bring, um, we can, or the scope of what you need, we can actually calculate the price. But having this, having more understanding of the willingness they pay, getting an understanding of what are the what are the budgets they usually have, what what support they usually um, have on others, and talking a little bit with them will always give you the possibility of getting a better understanding and then adapting your price um, to the individual needs of, of the client. Yeah. So, for example, if I have potential clients who need support in sales topics and I bring industry knowledge to the table, let's say in travel or in real estate um, or, I don't know, in moving to, to the Movinga project or whatever, um, and we, we they get a task, I will take that into a consideration and say, look, I don't only bring the sales value, I bring process value and I bring I bring um, the industry value. And on, on the one side and on the other side, I understand the budgets they have for and then I make them an individual offer, even so it's it's on the same it's on the same project. So yes, you should discriminate on prices because every every client is a little different, has different budgets, is used to different prices, and you can support them differently. So one thing, uh, in my opinion, there's a couple of other things we should consider while defining the price point, and that's purely looking at, at the rates of pricing points. And this is mainly the psychology about selling and how clients perceive prices. Yeah. First, from my experience, when charging by our hourly client, clients purely looking on the hourly rate, yeah, instead of total project um, estimates or project value. So, for example, um, if I have calculated a project, um, they rather buy a let's say five thousand four hundred project at sixty hours for euro, ninety euros instead. Um, a 5,400 euro project with 54 hours at 100 euros rate, yeah, because they look only on the on the the 100 euros and they don't look at total value, price value. Yeah, on the other side, they're more likely to buy a thousand euro project fixed price or a thousand euro project than a four hours for 250 euros um, an hour rate because they purely look on the hourly rate. Uh, but another very interesting learning I made is that clients. Um, are much likely to accept the project management fee than an increased um, daily or hourly rate. So, for example, for my first year, I was, uh, where I was still working as a freelancer, I really tried a lot of different things in order to understand what pricing works or whatnot. So, I tried to increase my, my day. We worked on day rate. So, I tried to increase my day rate by 15%. Frankly speaking, it didn't really work out in the first year. But then I added a project management fee by 15% to more or less the same client group. And this they, they signed without even negotiating about it. So again, they looked on the day rate. They didn't look at the, at the total um, project value. Another learning is, um, and that was quite important and quite harsh, if, you're late, if your rates are too low, your clients will not believe in the quality of your service. Um, and that's why it's important, again, to do price discrimination based on your different clients. So for example, my day rate for startups was fine, but my day rate for SMEs was way too low. So they didn't buy, and they even told me, they said, look, your rate is too low. We don't believe that you can actually help us. Yeah? Um, another learning is beware when negotiating. Not mistakenly show that you actually, um, let's say, open for right away, right away open for discounts. So be strong, believe in your prices. Yeah? As harder you negotiate, and as as more and, and you clearly state what your prices are, as less you need to actually reduce discounts. It's fair to give discounts on high volume or yeah, to reduce the price. I wouldn't call it discount. I never call my price discount. We just reduce your rates. I looked at the high volume. We have less administrative tasks, so we calculate it down. But believe in your believe in your prices and 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 be hard when negotiating. Yeah and. One thing there, even so, you're in the beginning hard, and then they, they will say no because um, of your rate. You can still be able to, to renegotiate the prices, yeah? But don't be open right in the beginning. Look, my day rate is 1,000 euros, and, but you can have it for 900. So your day rate is not 1,000, it's 900. And then last not, but not least, um, I think the most interesting learning on pricing for me was um, clients' willingness to pay, pay higher prices 
when you're using a brand to sell. Yeah. So in the beginning, I was selling Michael Jäger, and then I very fast changed to selling Kremansky. And without only with changing the name already, the negotiation on prices were reduced to accepting much higher prices. So also I was um, more or less a single person selling. I used the brand right away, put all my communication in the brand. So the perception of prices were higher. So <laughs> Victoria, I understand. Understanding this um, gives you already many possibilities, in my opinion, in playing around with your prices and your offers. Thank you very much. And anyway, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm on LinkedIn with Michael Yodjeger, and then you have my email address, my mobile number, um, anytime. I can't hear you, actually. <laughs> I was too happy, you know, like to, to talk to you, to forgot to unmute myself. Um, I was really happy to hear uh, that you talked about value-based pricing. I think this is so important and especially uh, for like creative people because it, I, I, at least it, I see it very often that somehow creative people, yeah, like mostly charge, you know, by hour and they don't value their ideas and thinking. And yeah. uh, now talking about in general, any solopreneur or any business person, uh, it's not only uh, what we do in an hour or on a computer, but also our thoughts. It's like economy of mind, right? Our ideas Absolutely. are the most precious things that we can sell these days. Everything else, it's like it's already created, only our brain and our mind. So, so that's, that's amazing. Let's have a look uh, if we have any questions. Uh, it takes uh, a little bit of time for, for them to upload. Uh, come on, guys, you know, like value-based pricing, I'm pretty sure you should have some, some questions to ask. Okay, so then I, I will start uh, as well. <laughs> so um, again, I, I would like to hear, you know, like for, from your story, you know, like what was the most difficult for you in your in your learning journey? And uh, maybe even now you still have certain things when it comes to sales that still do not come as easy or smooth as uh, you would like to. Oh, okay, forget my question. We have someone <laughs> asking. <laughs> What's the best way to transition from client work to high ticket value-based consulting next matter? use of industry knowledge, preferably on retainer. Um, fair question. So for, for me, it, what, we always, what I always focused on was having very good client relationships. Yeah? So um, we, whenever we closed the deal or we, we worked on a project, we always took care that, um, that we have good communication with our clients. Why saying that? Because obviously, let's say we always do, we all do mistakes and I do mistakes as well. And sometimes if we do mistakes, we can solve them by talking to them. So this was the first part. And then having very good client relationships and having satisfied client helped me to do to, to two things. First, I got more introductions. If you get an introduction, it's much easier to sell higher rates. And second of all, I could use my old clients um, to give to give feedback on the projects um, we did before. So they really believed us or me and then us that we can deliver on high value, that we can deliver a high value for them. Yeah. Um, another part is that what let's say we I started quite fast with very high prices, for us very high prices. Yeah. Um, and uh, we didn't go into the nitty-gritty small things and we just say, look, especially in sales, it's much easier because it's easier to calculate, right? I know what the value I bring. I can say, look, that's the conversion rate we expect. Um, and this is the value I bring. And that's why we do it. And then we maybe let us down and give a volume based, but we didn't really calculate in discounts. So answering the question, get introductions, get a lot of good clients um, so they can help you getting um, talking about you nicely and it will in increase your, your pricing. Um, so let's say um, it, it's not, I, let's say my first year, I didn't have anything to show, to be honest, right? So I think, I think um, being, getting a freelancer, you know, have a certain value, bring a certain experience um, and talk about your experience. So what have you done and why are you the right person? So if you go to a client, ask yourself, why, what value can you bring? And if you know the value you can bring, communicate it to the client and say, look, this is what we what we can help you with. That's my experience I can show and now get to know me. And then, and then we, we start doing. So what I usually do, and we still do this, is I have 
usually a first call with our clients um, to get to know each other. And then I offer, um, for example, a one hour um, feedback session where they show me a little bit around and I pick the things where I can see right away so they get an understanding on what I'm working on. So or how I think and how I can solve things. And this, this helped me quite good in, um, in, getting, in getting projects um, and convincing them. And on the other side, I, I built, let's say, in my, my foundings before, um, I, I always tried, if I helped someone or someone got to know me, to include them in my, in my starting time. So I wanted they look, can you give them feedback? You know me. Um, and then I got feedback or they, I connected them and they spoke then what I do and what I'm not doing, able to do. And this helped me always a lot. So I'm always using my network that people talk about me or that um, I get feedback and I connect them and say, look, speak openly. You can do, um, ask them the right questions, what we, what, how I help them and how not. And then, um, and then we, we finalized it. I hope this answers your question. Uh, I, I think so. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Michael. That was uh, amazing input. And uh, I, I really hope, you know, like everyone that took the notes because so, so much uh, great advice, tips and input. Uh, so thank, thank you very much. Very much. And yeah, and uh, everyone can get in touch and connect um, with Michael on LinkedIn and do that. Don't, don't, don't miss this opportunity. Uh, yes. And uh, now I don't put your notepads, uh, you know, like away yet. Uh, because uh, now uh, we have uh, Alan and he promised to help us to discover our sales approach. So Alan, please, the stage is yours. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everybody for sticking around. Um, so just a little background about myself. Um, I also started off originally in advertising sales, um, just like Timo. And then um, I eventually moved into marketing and sales management in the financial services industry, primarily with banks. Um, and so uh, I had had a tactic or a skill that um, allowed me to be able to go in and turn underperforming uh, locations into top performing teams. Um, and that was able to help move me from the Midwest of the US where I was uh, originally born um, to the East Coast and eventually to uh, Manhattan where I was working for JP Morgan. And um, I managed a team of 27. We had uh, $1.2 billion in assets that we were managing um, and we brought in roughly $36 million a year in uh, annual sales. And then I got the lucky opportunity to uh, be able to move with my family to a Wiesbaden just outside of Frankfurt, which gave me a nice little break and and also probably put me in a situation that's similar to most of you solar entrepreneurs, where you can look back at what you used to do and realize, I don't want to do that anymore. Um, and for me, it was the realization that I just didn't really want to go back and work in, um, in uh, corporate America, um, especially in the high pressure areas of sales. But I knew I had these skills. Um, and that I knew I could um, uh, raise awareness of brands and that I knew I could take sales teams and uh, turn them into top performers. So I was trying to come up with an idea while I was, um, while I was there and decide what was I going to do? What was going to be my next step? And um, for me, I was lucky enough, I was getting my MBA through a dual university program called uh, EBS. Um, and then another one in uh, England called Durham University. And that allowed me to bring in, um, allowed me to get to experience and chat with a lot of different consultants from different firms. And um, I kind of realized that there was a piece that was missing uh, that the other consulting firms were really focusing on. And that was revenue generation. So um, instead of a company that was focusing on optimizing uh, expenses, negotiating, renegotiating contracts from suppliers, um, I took the angle that there was a need for us to go out and actually work to try to um, generate more funds versus um, cutting expenses. And so I created the company in 2017. I spent um, from uh, 2017 until here at the beginning of 2021, also as a solopreneur, um, where I was doing the full road. So I was finding the leads, I was making contacts, uh, I was doing the work. Um, and so I understand from your side that there's there's there was a lot of stress in that. There's a lot of stress in it for me. Um, and then now I have finally taken the move here in 2021, um, where I'm building out a team. Um, so. I'm, I'm hoping that what I'm going to present today will uh, help you get a, um, a good understanding of kind of the process that I went through um, and then uh, some ideas to be able to help you actually get your uh, sales, uh, your sales um, plan together. So 
let me share my screen really quickly here. One second, please. There we go. Oh, sorry, I'm having a bit of issues here. All right, can you see my screen now? All right, so what we're going to do through now is we're gonna discover and discuss about your sales approach. So there's a few things that, my, uh, that are part of my goal for today. So um, by the time I go through the process, I want you to understand which sales approaches best fit you, which fit your, your industry, your product, and then I'm gonna discuss a little bit about how to adjust your approach to match the buyer's personality. So when you talk about sales approaches in general, there's, there's three guiding principles. So the first one is that all approaches start with the goal of building a relationship and helping people. The next thing I want you to think about is that when you're working with a sales approach, you don't want to just focus on mastering one approach. Instead, you want to know a couple different approaches. And that's primarily because you're going to need to adapt your methodology to the situation and to your buyer's personality. So there's a few things that there's a, there's three common sales approaches that I want to discuss as we're going through this here today. And while there are a ton of other approaches, um, it, things can pretty much balance down to some form of these three. And so those three are the relationship-based sales, the challenger, and then the champ selling system. So with relationship-based sales, this is really focused on building sales through relationships and then matching the buyer's need to your product's fit. It's best used uh, when you're building uh, relationships for long with long-term clients or you have a long sales cycle or they have a long buyer cycle. So there's six key steps that you'll go through uh, when you're working with this sales approach. And so the first one is that you're going to want to find commonality and you're going to get to know your buyer on a personal level creating an environment of trust and openness. Then you're gonna to wanna to talk less than your buyer and really focus on uncovering their needs, finding out their point of view, their goals and their challenges, and then getting an understanding of if your product is a good fit. Next, you wanna connect how their needs and your solution are uniquely matched to solve their problem. And you wanna also add how your product adds value to the situation then you're going to want to uncover and resolve the buyer's objections and you're going to want to do this politely and remembering that even though it might seem like a minor issue to you it is a concern to your buyer then you want to focus on finding a win-win situation um, and make sure that you're also still continuing to build trust and create that long-term relationship and then finally you want to remember is that after you have closed the sale, you still want to stay in contact with your buyer so that you can keep adding value. So the next one I want to talk about is the challenger. And this one's a little different. This one is about educating your buyer about a problem they either undervalue or they don't know they have, and then how your product solves that problem. So this might sound weird, but I'm going to guarantee that you've all kind of heard of this process because it was updated later on and it was renamed and it was called the elevator pitch. But for this presentation, I, we're going to, I want to focus on the longer process, which is the challenge, the challenger. So there's six key steps with this process also. And the first step is that you want to describe a problem to a buyer in a way that gains their agreement to the idea that, that a problem exists. Then after that, you want to deliver insights about the problem that your buyer has not previously considered so they think about the issue in a new way. Then you want to explain the cost associated with the problem in a way that, gets the, that gains the buyer's understanding of why they should be concerned. And then you want to tell a story about how the problem negatively affected other companies in similar situations with them in a familiar and painful way. Then you want to explain the changes your buyer would have to adapt to solve the problem. And then finally, you're going to introduce your solution 
and explain how it helps your buyer adapt those behaviors better than any other approach. So I added the CHAMP selling system because this was a system that was designed specifically for the mid-market and enterprise SAAS sales and sales management. So when you think about this process, it has four key steps. And the important thing to remember with this is it's a situation where you want to find and uncover three things, and then you want to set one impression when you're working with the buyer. So the first, the first priority is, again, to understand the buyer's challenges, their situation, uh, whether your product can help the buyer solve their issues. The next is authority. So you're going to want to find out who has the authority to make the buying decision, how long, what is um, their process, and then if there's anybody along the way that might be able to deter against you actually winning this contract. Then the next is money. Now, this is the part that you want to set an impression. So this is all about focusing on how much should be invested to gain a specific return on investment instead of allocating an existing budget. So I, you want to really focus on creating a budget for implementing your product and then gain their support for moving funds from other priorities to yours. And then the last part with this is that you really want to focus on understanding how much of a priority is it to solve this issue and what is their timeline? So now I'm going to move into a bit more interactive. So um, this is going to be a time period when I'm going to ask you a group of questions. And this is by going down through this pyramid, we're actually going to be able to have you figure out which sales approach would be best for your product and for your services. And as you'll notice, the first four are all about choosing the approach. And then the last one is about adjusting your approach. So let's talk about the first one. So if you would just write down for me, and I'll give you a few seconds after I go through each one of these, these, these sections um, for you to be able to, to write some things down. So for, this, for the target audience, just write down what is your target audience? And then what is unique about the companies to who you are selling? How will you divide those in, that industry into segments? And then how will you prioritize which segments you're going to go after? And as you're doing this, think about a couple things. First, think about does your service or product solve a problem that the industry knows exist? And so they're just looking for someone that can understand their needs and solve that problem. Or does that target industry not realize that they have this problem? So you're going to need to educate them about the problem and then you're going to have to tie how you can solve this problem. So I'll give you just a couple seconds here just to be able to write some things down. Okay, let's move on to talking about who's your buyer. So if what I want you to do is describe their profile. What's their role? What's their title? Uh, what do they currently do without having your product? And then explain how your product makes your customer either grow revenue, improve margins, make their job easier, or how your product will affect their clients and their coworkers. And I'm, I'm asking you to think about those questions because those are, those are things that are going to be important to the buyer. So you can kind of need to frame um, your pitch or your presentation to match those things. And then again, just like with the, the target industry, I want you to think about, does your buyer need to be educated about a problem that you can solve, or do they already know the problem exists and you just need to be able to match your abilities to solve their needs? So I'll give you a few more minutes here on this one. Okay, let's move on to what are they buying. So what problem are you solving? Then also think about what are you selling, a product or an emotion? And I'll challenge you on this one a little bit. Um, I'm going to tell you that in a lot of cases, you're selling an emotion. And I'll give you two examples. So the first one is people don't buy a Rolex because they need something that tells time. They buy a Rolex because it gives them prestige and it makes people think that they're successful. 
Likewise, if you're selling a technology, um, you're not necessarily selling an app or a software system. You might want to be selling um, the ability for your client to feel like they're at the forefront of innovation. Or maybe it's that they are being more innov innovative than their competition. So just think about a little bit about what's the easiest way with your product to, to be able to gain some emotion. And then I want you to de describe what you're selling and then think about it from the other side and describe what the buyers will be thinking they're buying. And then look and see if there's a difference between the two. And if there are, then most likely you want to switch to what the buyers think they're getting. And I'll give you a few seconds for that. Okay, so then the last is your personality. So you need to think about, are you an inquisitive person? Are you empathetic? Um, are you analytical? Are you something else or are you a mixture of them all? Because it, most likely you're going to be a mixture of a couple different things with just one personality that stands out a little more. And along with that, I want you to think about, do you like educating people about something they don't know? So what a problem that they don't know exists? Or do you prefer to be able to sit down with people and have discussions about needs that they currently have and then how you'll solve those needs? And I'll give you a few seconds for that one. Okay, so hopefully through those, you've been able to kind of guide yourself towards possibly what approach might be, might might work best. I, I'm guaranteeing I completely understand that at this point, you're not going to know exactly, but at least now you might be on a path to be able to get you to there. So then let's talk about how the personality of your buyer is going to make you want to adjust your approach. So I've put four personalities on here. I, I I know that not everyone is going to fit into um, each individual profile. That's not kind of how we work as humans. Um, there are going to be a mix of these, but we might have one that's that's more dominant. And so I just kind of want to go through explaining, uh, the, defining those. And then after this, I'm going to go give you a couple examples of how you might adjust your approach or maybe which approach might work best with this cust with these buyers. Um, so the first one is the assertive. So they're very goal oriented, straight to the point and competitive. Uh, they care more about the results of their relationship. Uh, they care more about their results than their relationship. Um, so this might be a group where just off the cuff that maybe the champion program might work well with them. Um, maybe it also might be the relationship based sales approach. The next group is amiable. And so they value relationships and they need to trust their business partners. They also enjoy excite, uh, get excited about learning new things. So again, this one might be the relationship-based sales, but then again, it also might be a challenger because they like learning about new things. The next is impressive, uh, expressive, and they purposefully use their emotions when making decisions. Uh, and they're very concerned about others' well-being um, and how their decision affects the people around them. So this might, this would definitely lead me to be more towards someone that would be interested in a relationship based sales approach. And then finally, we have the analytic. So they love data, they love facts, and they love figures, and they will look right past the flowery pitch, and they want to get straight into the details. Okay, so let's dig a little bit deeper into the analytics. So here the so once again, some of their common personality traits are they really are into data, facts, and figures. They're going to ask, ask extremely detailed questions and don't get tricked up because most of the time they're going to know the answer to those questions. They're going to be testing to see if you know the answer to those questions. And that's because they've already done deep research. They probably are going to have a longer buyer process, and that's because they want to be 99.99% sure in their decision. So here's some selling tips. So to start off, you don't want to try to educate them on something they didn't know existed. Um, they, you know, they come from an, a standpoint where they think that they have researched and they know everything that's going on. So that right there tells me that the challenger approach is probably not going to be something that would be good with them. So instead, you want to focus on uncovering their needs and matching them to your product. So that kind of leads towards the relationship-based sales approach. 
Uh, next, you want to make sure that you don't make high level claims or use flowery language as they'll feel that you're being overly flattery and you're flattering and you're going to lose their confidence. And instead, you want to relate on um, reliable data and factually explain the key benefits using statistics, survey results, and percentages. Also, don't push them towards a deadline uh, as there's no shortcuts with analytical personalities. Instead, take your time, give them patience, and follow up because that's really going to be appreciated. So next, let's talk a little bit about how to sell to the expressive. So some common personalities with the expressive is that they, they value personal relationships and loyalty. They expect mutual respect. They care deeply about others. They have very strong personalities and they're highly confident and rely on intuition. So with this group, you really wanna spend a lot of time building a connection um, and explaining how you're going to add value and how you hope for an ongoing relationship which kind of dings towards, hey, this might be a relationship-based sales approach. But then they also are very open to new ideas that they have not considered, and especially discussions about how that might affect others in their organization. So that leans you towards challenger. So then you also want to look at that they focus on explaining how, you want to focus on explaining how their decision will affect the organization and their coworkers on a human level. You also want to check in with them to make sure they're on the same page. So you, several times you might want to ask, so we agree that, or something along that line. And then you really want to focus on how you would support them after the sale. And finally, don't spend a whole lot of time on facts and figures. Uh, they're going to be much more important to them to have, uh, to have a relationship and to build trust and to know that you're not going to do anything that's going to take away from that trust. So this one, there's a couple different styles that might work. So finally, as we've gone through this whole process, there's three things that I really want you to be able to take away. So number one is that I wanna make sure that you, um, that you understand that the common goal is to build relationships and help people. Number two is to be flexible and understand that you'll need to use multiple approaches. And number three, you need to adjust your approach to the buyer using an approach that matches the buyer's personality. And, um, once again, I'm going to, I hope that you found value from the presentation. Um, if you have not already connected with me through LinkedIn, this here's my QR code. And if you will scan it, that will get you into me. And uh, I look forward to talking with you in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Alan. Um, I, I couldn't, you know, like write enough to, to take all the notes. Uh, what I also want to mention to to the listeners, to uh, to the guys, that Alan is based uh, in the US, in New York, but actually he works internationally, so also in Europe. So keep that in mind uh, if you want to get in touch with him. You know, like he 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 is not that far away, and especially now when everything is digital. So you know, that's right. Um, I've got a <laughs> I've got a team of three already in Germany. So so yeah. here we go. You know, like keep that in mind. Uh, so while we wait for questions uh, to to upload, um, I have a question. Then, which which uh, approach maybe is the most uh, common uh, you see? Uh, like uh, that is like you, you yeah you see happening. You know, like more, more, most of the time. You know, like in your work, what kind of clients? So what I've so for most people, unless you have something that's completely new new to the market. Um, if you're on the consulting side, it's going to be the relationship-based sales approach because you're going to want to get in and discover what their issues are, especially if it's something where you can do, you provide multiple different services. Uh, so you can get in and you can say, let's, let's talk about your issues. Um, uh, for us, it's uh, talking about if your revenue is at the level that it needs to be. And then we start getting into at what point is the level, you know, is, is the revenue dropping? Is it that you're not attracting enough people? Are you not building an emotional connection with your clients? Is it that, um, you know, your sales team is fumbling with leads and not being able to stay in connection and build those relationships? Um, but in most situations, um, it, it's that relationship-based sales approach. Yeah, it sounds uh, sounds really like that. We we all people, so we we want it to be not like just you know 
I don't know, strictly business, but more like yeah, human interaction and also like uh, taking from what the you know the previous uh, speaker said. It's yeah, it's you're you're helping, you're helping, and uh, yep. you're helping in in a relationship. Um, what kind of scared me a little bit is a uh, client type, the analytical one. Uh, it seemed like uh, if we, having that kind of client, it, it, there's not much fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say this: the one of the things, if especially if you're using, an, if you go in with a needs-based um, sales approach, and um, the one good thing about when you deal with an analytical person is when you come in and you sit down and you start having a conversation with them, they're very quickly going to tell you exactly what their problems are because they've they've they already have discovered it. So that needs discovery. It's it's not hard to pull out of them where the where the problems are or where they see that things need to improve. So that's one of the great that's one of the the great things of, about working with them is that they'll tell you straight in, these are my problems. Can you solve them? And if you can't solve them, great. Um, you know, if you can't solve them, it's a short conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um yeah, if you remember, uh, Thibault was talking about uh, his second step is uh, quantifying the problem, you know, like finding more of what's hiding behind that. So I would imagine with an analytical type of um, customer, uh, it probably could be quite difficult because they, they would, you know, if you start doing that, they would assume that you don't trust their judgment. Uh, or Well, you can still ask questions like... Um like when you're in the discovery process, the, the easiest question is always just tell me more because you're not passing judgment on anything. You're just saying, I want to know more about that. So if they say that um, uh, they're having products connecting with customers, then just say, you know, well, tell me a little more about that. And then they'll just go into more detail. They might, especially if it's an analytic, they might be able to give you some facts and you know, and statistics to be able to say this is the point where we see it, and this is the number of people who fall off um, from our our sales funnel, and and in this spot. So it it's all about um, much like how I talked about overcoming objections. It's about how you say things to be able to get people to open up, versus necessarily what you're saying. Um, yeah, may, that, makes sense absolutely. And now we have a question. Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, it all depends on how flexible you are. Um, so if you're someone that is completely comfortable talking to all kinds of different personalities at the same time, then I would say go with that. Um, if you're not, if you're not super comfortable with that, um, then you can focus on one personality type and go that direction. But my caveat to this is um, eventually, hopefully, your business is going to grow. And as your business grows, you're really not going to be able to, to say, I only want to deal with one personality type at, at this point. Um, so at, at some point in the process, you're going to have to get comfortable with dealing with, you know, with presenting your approach to people of all different types of, of uh, personalities. Just at just hopefully out of nature as, as it grows. That's just, you know, we'll, you'll kind of get lead in that direction. Oh, that's a good one. How do you detect those type of people in advance? All right, so at, so there's gonna be multiple steps that are gonna take place before you're actually sitting in front of them and you're going to be presenting with them. And that's where the, that's where the sales approach comes into play. Um, and so by that point, hopefully you will have had some email interactions. Maybe you've had a video chat to be able to start the process and say, you know, hey, maybe it's, you know, you're in that, hey, it might be a good idea for us to get together and be able to discuss whether I can help you or whether we can, you know, grow uh, mutually, um, whatever that that lead is going to be. Um, you're already going to have some of that going. So just make sure that in that that first stage that you're just very open and just, just try to learning how um, how they react to different things that you say and how you see their, you know, their, how their person comes across in that point. And then that prepares you so that then when you're either sitting in front of them or you're, you're doing it virtually um, and you're getting ready to go through uh, discovering, you know, because remember, they all start with building rapport. So as you're starting to build rapport, you'll know which direction you need to shoot off. I hope that answers. 
Yeah, I think so. It's uh, precise. It's not like we're jumping straight away in a, in a deep end. It still starts somewhere and from small uh, signals or messages, we can kind of start getting more or less the idea, you know, like what type it would be. And then, of course, later on, it could be adjusted one way or the other. Exactly. Yeah, yep. so I think, like you, like you were saying also, you know, like to be uh, flexible with the approaches and to not just to put the client in one box and say, that's it, now you're going to be analytical for the rest of your life and you will never <laughs> do yep. anything else. That's that's great. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, for, uh, for all your insights. Uh, and uh, also thank you uh, to Thibault and Michael. I think... Uh, if now, you know, like everyone who participated, who joined the session, if you, if you are not better in sales, then I don't know what else can help you. <laughs> Definitely so much input. Also, the good news is that uh, this, uh, this event will also be uh, on the factory YouTube channel. So you can always replay and, you know, like take it step by step and really, you know, like build yourself a nice uh, kind of sales uh, sales uh, approach tactics and strategies you know like for your business so ah, one last question there so alan uh, will you answer one last question quickly and sure. then we will <laughs> sure so let's see one last... so yes um so yeah so this is all I'm going to take. This is um, mostly as you're talking about how you're going to actually present to your client. And so, um, yeah, you're going to have discovered that as you're going along through the process, what works best um, and what's what's the best approach for that. And that's really when you want to get into when you're putting together your um, your sales presentation, which says, here's your needs. This is why why I say that um, my product solves your your need the best. Um, and you're going to want to adjust that. So the ones that are, if they're analytical, they may want to see more spreadsheets. Um, when the ones that are um, uh, more amiable, they're going to maybe you you uh, you present a history of things that you've done for past clients, so that they build that trust and understand. Okay, I'll go with you because I know these companies, and um, you know you were able to help them. I hope that explains. So in, in that case, uh, I think now uh, we are uh, slowly, slowly everyone is uh, getting ready. Well, at least in Berlin, I guess, uh, for, for the evening. Uh, <laughs> in other parts of the world, the day only starts. So, you know, like it, it's not over. So, yeah, as I said, uh, I'm very grateful that uh, you, Alan, and the rest, you were able to make it and to really share your knowledge. And I know sales is a very big topic, so maybe in the future uh, we will continue. Uh, yeah, let's, let's leave it like this, to be continued, because the, the, the topic, it, it's not over. There's still so much to learn. So, uh, and, yeah, like... Um, Everyone, please don't, don't you know, don't be shy. Connect with Alan on LinkedIn. He shared his contacts, and and be in touch and um, and learn and um, more. So, uh, on that note, uh, I would wish everyone uh, in Europe uh, a nice evening, <laughs> and uh, Alan to you a nice and still productive day. Uh, and um, yes. Uh, I think now, like, I definitely feel like uh, I will approach sales uh, in, in a different way and it will be so much easier and more enjoyable. <laughs> so thanks a lot.